Welcome to Basics of Homemade Blended Tube Feeding Preparation. I'm your presenter, Dr. Teresa Johnson. I'm a professor at Troy University and a registered dietitian nutritionist with over 30 years in clinical practice. In this brief presentation, participants will evaluate the current literature regarding concerns about foodborne illness and blenderized tube feeding, outline food safety and sanitation measures in blended tube feeding preparation, and evaluate different methods of creating homemade blenderized tube feeding. First, we want to address a major concern of homemade blended tube feeding. That is, foodborne illness due to bacterial contamination. Most studies showing high microbial loads in BTF were conducted in countries where food handling conditions are quite different from those expected in the United States and other developed countries. Consequently, we conducted a comparison study of commercial enteral formula, a baby food blend, and a whole food blend tube feeding in a U.S. hospital setting. The food blends were prepared in the hospital kitchen, and we followed accepted food safety standards of U.S. hospitals and homes. All three formulas were poured into tube feeding bags and delivered via pump for four hours in a non-occupied hospital room. We ran the formula into a trash receptacle. We sampled the products at baseline two hours and four hours. We did this experiment on three different occasions. We found that there was no difference in bacterial load between the commercial or blended tube feeding at any point, even when we violated the hang time by two additional hours. All three feedings were acceptable for human consumption, meeting the U.S. FDA guidelines. In a follow-up study, we measured microbial load of 50 home blended tube feeding preparations using the same whole food blend recipe that we employed in the hospital study. We delivered meal kits to 50 participants who agreed to follow acceptable methods of cleaning the blender and utensils prior to the arrival of the meal kits and prepare the blend according to the directions that we gave them. They prepared the blend, poured it into a feeding bag, and placed it in ice in a cooler. The coolers were returned to the lab for processing, and the uh, specimens were held at refrigeration temperatures during the entire time of testing. Colony counts and detection for E. coli and S. aureus and coliform were conducted again at baseline 24 and 48 hours. There was no significant increase in microbial counts over the 48 hours that they were refrigerated. 88% of the samples met the U.S. guideline for safe consumption in contrast to international studies showing just the reverse. Only two samples of the 150 plates measured slightly above 10 to the 5 colony forming units and none exceeded 10 to the 6 colony forming units. In the United States, the cut point is uh, food may not have more than 10 to the 3 CFUs. Again, this is in direct contrast to findings of published work that has been carried out in other countries with very different environments. However, it is notable that no published study has linked blenderized tube feeding to higher rates of infections in patients. Also, Using commercial formula doesn't assure that there will be no contamination. A review of all published studies, again, indicates it's the handling of the formula rather than the type of the formula that is responsible for bacterial contamination. Now we will quickly review three steps required for successful blenderized tube feeding. Step one is to enlist the help of a registered dietitian nutritionist to establish nutrition goals and set up a meal plan that meets these goals. Remember that follow-up is also crucial. Step two is to help the patient obtain the proper tools needed. These will vary depending on the BTF plan. Step three is to teach the patient or caregiver to demonstrate food safety and sanitation measures in BTF preparation. This includes prep, storage, cleanup, and delivery of the feeding. The RDN will begin with a complete nutrition assessment that considers age, medications, diagnoses, nutrition goals, and patient resources and capacity. Tube size and delivery method must also be assessed. For example, will this patient receive their feeding by pump or syringe or bag? A partial BTF using baby food is recommended for the little ones between six and nine months of age and when transitioning to 100% BTF at one year. 
Adults may also benefit from a partial baby food BTF. Observing any potential benefit before investing in an expensive blender or moving completely to home prepared BTF. The RDN will need to access the patient or caregiver for consistent follow-up and recurring evaluation. The RDN may suggest and employ one of three methods for creating a BTF meal plan. The Choose My Plate tool, the Exchange method, and the Recipe method. The Choose My Plate app offers the advantages of mimicking family meals. They can be customized, they provide dietary variety, and this resource is free. The exchange system also supports dietary variety, but is helpful when trying to meet more specific energy, macro, and micronutrient goals. Familiar foods are selected and exchanged to create a variety of recipes. An online recipe builder using the exchange system approach is also available. The third approach is to assist with development of very specific recipes. Analysis of the recipe is essential and many recipes that have already been analyzed are freely available online, just like the one illustrated here. A BTF recipe should start with a liquid protein base such as milk or formula. Additional solid food protein may be needed, including beef or poultry or fish. Next, we add a carbohydrate source above what is provided in the liquid base. Grains such as rice, barley, or oat and starchy vegetables improve the calorie profile without exceeding the volume. Non-starchy vegetables add bulk and increase total volume without contributing very many calories. Nevertheless, a good blend should include some green and red-orange vegetables and a source of vitamin C. Once the volume of the recipe is set, it can be doubled or tripled to reach the desired nutrition goal for the day. Again, be sure the recipe is analyzed completely as possible, including essential fatty acid ratio profile. In some cases, adding baby food to commercial formula achieves the goal of addressing tube feeding intolerance. And as I said previously, it's a good strategy to see if the patient can tolerate BTF before investing in an expensive high capacity blender. Usually no blending is needed when baby foods are used. But if clogging is an issue, 20 seconds in an inexpensive home blender is adequate to prevent clogging. Also, cow's milk and formula as the liquid base will provide more calories, fat, and protein than a plant-based milk. Increasing nutrient and calorie density helps to achieve nutrition goals in a reasonable volume. One other tip. The tube extender on the B-Fed system for BTF delivery is compatible with the cap on pureed pouches sold in grocery stores. This makes it really easy to give a pureed snack on the go. In our parents of children who use BTF, about half of the respondents using BTF stated they pureed what they serve their family rather than using one or two recipes all the time. This is a good approach provided that these meals approximate recommendations of the dietary guidelines. A commercial high velocity blender will be needed and food pureed for four to five minutes in order to prevent clogged tubes. Again, even when using foods provided to the rest of the family, we still need a high protein calorie liquid base like milk or formula. When transitioning from commercial to BTF, one food at a time is added with observation for any intolerance or signs of allergic reaction. When using frozen fruits and vegetables, cook according to package directions. Using frozen and canned versions of ingredients can reduce risk for bacterial contamination, but fresh foods can also be used. However, based on our research, I recommend that all fresh foods used in a blended tube feeding be cooked. This will reduce bacterial counts. Also, note the dates on milk and purchase those with the longest expiration date. A multivitamin might be needed depending on the recipe. If a wide variety of foods are provided, a supplement is not necessary. But this is why nutrient analysis is so important. Some recipes, particularly baby food-based recipes, may not provide adequate sodium. 
If dairy products are not tolerated, additional calcium and vitamin D may be needed. It's important to provide the proper essential fatty acid ratio, especially in growing children. Using canola oil or a blend of olive and cod liver oil provides the ideal omega-3 to 6 ratio. Blenderized tube feeding is approximately 75% free water, so additional fluid will be needed to assure hydration needs are met. Remember that recipe adjustments will be needed as children grow or as patient conditions and medications change. This is why follow-up is critical. Although a high power blender can liquefy most any food, some foods may be problematic for blended tube feeding. Olives, white pasta, white rice, breads, muffins, and bagels tend to gum up in the blender. Eggs can become lumpy if not thoroughly cooked before putting in the blender. And if not well cooked, stringy foods like celery and string beans will clog the tube. Flaxseed is also difficult to blend. Fruits with skins may clog tubes. Getting the volume right may require several adjustments. Water is needed to reduce the viscosity of a blend so that it will go through the tube. However, too much water dilutes nutritional value and makes it difficult to meet the DRI values within a reasonable volume. Overuse of the non-starchy vegetables can make it difficult to achieve nutrition and volume goals. A good BTF recipe is more calorically dense than a standard polymeric formula. BTF users generally need several ounces of water before and after a BTF to achieve proper hydration. Remember that the same food safety guidelines apply when making BTF. Proper hand washing, clean surfaces and utensils and prevention of cross-contamination is required. Ingredients must be thoroughly cooked and the water source evaluated for any potential contamination. Dairy and fruit juices must be pasteurized. The blender has been identified as a potential source of contamination in BTF. First, the blender must be designed such that it can be completely disassembled. Some models do not allow for the blades and gasket to be removed from the base of the container and should not be used for BTF preparation. Some of the commercial blenders may not be used in a dishwasher because of potential damage to the container and rubber seals. Consequently, they must be disassembled and sanitized per the U.S. Food Code requirements. Wash in soapy water, rinse, submerge in a chlorine solution for about a minute, and allow to air dry. Again, BTF preparation requires the same expected sanitation measures used at homes and hospitals, including proper hand washing, clean utensils and surfaces, and avoiding time and temperature violations. BTF must be prepared with clean and sanitized equipment, labeled and dated, stored at proper refrigeration temperatures, and discarded after 24 hours. Assure that thermometers are available. Homemade BTF should not be left at room temperature for more than two hours. However, commercial blenderized tube feeding may hang between 8 and 12 hours based on manufacturer recommendations. When homemade blenderized tube feeding is not an option, commercial BTF may offer several advantages. First, they are prepared under sterile conditions. They're shelf stable. They can be used in every conceivable environment, including when a kitchen and equipment are not available for BTF or they're cost effective. Some patients routinely make BTF but rely on a commercial blend for travel, school, or other venues where making a blend is not feasible. To summarize, blenderized tube feeding is largely a patient and care driven phenomenon and failure to screen and guide patients who are interested in or who are using BTF may cause them to go it alone. BTF users and caregivers are often very passionate about their feeding choice, so providing support for their decision where it's appropriate is consistent with patient-centered care. I leave you with some, a sobering quote from one mother who said, 
I changed to blended feeding when it dawned on me one day that my son had not had a vegetable or a fruit in five years, and it was the best decision I ever made. Thank you for attending today. I hope that you found this information helpful. This educational offering was provided to you by Aspen, supported by an educational grant provided by Real Food Blends.